Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. And uh, we hope you're all well. Uh, we warmly welcome you now, you, our agencies uh, across Europe, uh, to our B2B webinar about Northern Norway. Now, we looked up the attendees uh, earlier today. It's quite impressive. We have a lot of signups, uh, as I said, uh, across Europe. Uh, we have guests from uh, Sweden today, UK, Czech Republic, Spain, Italy, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and many other European countries. Uh, the list doesn't end here. Um, we are very happy to have you here in our presentation. Unfortunately, we can't see you but you can see us and uh, we are pleased to receive a uh, response from you later after the presentation. Any questions, suggestions or wishes that you have, uh, just bring them across, send us a mail or uh, place them in the chat. Uh, somebody will read it uh, and attend to it uh, when you have uh, questions. Now with me today um, is our colleague, multi-skilled and multilingual, Bo Preno. <laughs> Say hello, hello, Bo. Hello everybody. Thanks for having me, Florian. Yes, you're welcome, Bo. A um, little bit about Bo. Bo grew up in uh, Canada. He graduated with a diploma in sustainable outdoor recreation management, That's including great. quite a number of subjects. I looked it up in your bio, yeah. Bo. Um, I hope you don't mind. I read it out to no everyone worries. in Europe now. Um, your studies included biology, wilderness guiding, wilderness uh, survival, canoe guiding, ropes climbing, plant geology, plant, sorry, uh, plant ecology, small engine mechanics, woodworking, marketing, and business management. Did I miss any skills? <laughs> that's, that's a pretty good sum up. Basically, the course was designed um, so that in, in Canada, for example, a lot of outfitters working in remote areas need to basically run their own business. So I needed, uh, it's very important for a guy to be multi-skilled in, in a little bit of everything. So he can fix his own cars, his own machines, build his own tables, do his own marketing, basically run a business from home. I'm a small business. And that was what the course had in mind with a focus on expedition guiding and canoe guiding, of course. Pretty good, Bo. Very impressive. Uh, now, Thank Bo, you. Um, you have to know, is an active member of staff with Oceanwide uh, uh, Expeditions. Um, and uh, in fact, he was expedition leader on the Rembrandt van Rijn. We are talking about our sailing vessel in northern Norway today. He was the expedition leader on the last trip in March uh, till the point uh, when we had to shut down operation yeah. due to yeah. COVID regulations, which came over us so promptly. Mm -hmm. um, not quite unexpectedly, but uh, we were in contact back then. You remember, Bo, and uh, we had guests on board, and then we had to uh, finish off in March. Uh, sadly, our ships are now all alongside in the Netherlands uh, um, in port, uh, laying up idle. Um, and uh, we are now here to try and uh, inspire you a little bit about uh, our program in North Norway, because we are meant to be in North Norway right now, right now with our vessel. Yeah. Um, but uh, now we can just uh, talk about it. Introducing myself briefly, um, I am uh, behind the planning of the Arctic program with uh, Ocean Wide Expeditions now for uh, almost 12 years, taking care of the international sales and uh, uh, with the support of my colleague Franklin, who is listening in right now, um, he is uh, taking care of the European accounts in the follow-up later. So at some point you will be in contact if you have not been in contact with him already, with Franklin, and uh, he will support us uh, with uh, some administration here also in the background. Now, um, we will be talking uh, about North Norway today, but uh, just taking a quick look back into history just to give you a bit of uh, an idea of uh, where we have started uh, doing business uh, in the mid 90s in 1996 ocean wide expeditions took over the activities from the plansius foundation and the plansius foundation was a non-commercial uh, foundation uh, or enterprise uh, that started already in the early uh, 80s. Uh, our good colleague, uh, Ko uh, Dakota, uh, who may now listen in to, uh, I'm not quite sure, uh, he has started uh, this side of uh, uh, Ocean White. He is uh, still around uh, also to uh, help us with good advice uh, when planning the programs in the Arctic and Antarctica. Now, when you look uh, up the timeline from uh, 1996 up to uh, the 
the recent years, uh, in 2009, uh, we acquired uh, the plants here, uh, prepared her for operation in the Arctic. We only operate in the in the polar regions, the cold waters. Uh, also, the Ortelius uh, came into play later. We purchased uh, the vessel in 2012 uh, and then uh, started uh, refurbishing the vessel to get her ready uh, for operation also in the polar waters. So we have won a few travel awards. Uh, that is just a side effect. It's a little appreciation of what we uh, have done so far, including also our uh, base camp concept that we have introduced to the market in 2010. Base camp concept you may have heard of. Uh, we started in uh, the Antarctic, introducing a lot of our activities uh, in uh, compact activities. Uh, fit into one uh, departure so everybody could uh, try out, dip in and try out uh, 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 for free. Um, they were not supplemented activities. You still find it in our program uh, today. So it's a very popular program, not uh, only amongst the younger people, also uh, middle-aged and older people, also people who have uh, never tried this kind of uh, activities before, like uh, kayaking or hiking, and they have always hoped to do uh, this kind of, uh, or these kind of activities and uh, when they come with us, they can uh, try it out for the first time. Now, we have uh, other ships coming up in the future. Jansonius uh, is uh, well on track uh, with uh, the building of the, the vessel is well on track. Uh, she will be um, with us uh, next year. Uh, she's the sister vessel of Hondius and Hondius uh, with just over 170 passengers uh, capacity on board uh, will has already started operation last year uh, successfully, um, but uh, unfortunately this year, like all the other vessels, uh, um, we are in port, uh, not operating in the Arctic and also not in Antarctica. The Antarctic program has also been called off you. I'm sure you have noticed that in our regular mailings. Now, my part here in this presentation is just to give you a, a brief uh, overview of uh, the routes um, where we go uh, when we sail down south to Antarctica. You see here on the picture on the illustration a circle around the Antarctic Peninsula. We operate in uh, Antarctica in the time period from November till March. And uh, in the Antarctic Peninsula here, uh, you see um, uh, the mostly hotspots, uh, penguins, um, uh, research stations, uh, all these interesting places that you would not like to miss out on when you go to Antarctica. We also visit the Weddell Sea. It's a very specialized itinerary with Ortelius. We carry a helicopter on the aft deck. Um, the helicopters, two of them, will be needed to overcome uh, ice barriers when we fly uh, to uh, Snow Hill Island and we land a, a good distance, a safe distance away, a respectful distance away from the wildlife, uh, the emperor penguin uh, colony. And uh, then uh, the final two or three kilometers will be walked to the, to the colony. Um, you can check on the details of the itinerary in our day-by-day -day, uh, programs. Now, uh, we also do something very exotic. I'm not sure if you have seen that in our portfolio. We are sailing with uh, Ortelius also. Uh, to the Ross Sea. Uh, we do that as a single uh, uh, trip uh, from, um, uh, it's a one-way direction, sorry. Um, we start in Ushuaia, we sail 31 nights uh, from Ushuaia uh, via the Ross Sea to New Zealand. Uh, we exit there and we do the same uh, voyage in reverse, starting in New Zealand via the Ross Sea and then back to uh, uh, South America, Ushuaia. So this is our operation down south um, in the Austro summer. And uh, up here in the Arctic, uh, that is my patch. Um, we operate uh, all year round. Uh, I'm not sure if you know, but uh, since we have introduced uh, our North Norway program uh, now four years ago, we put it into the market first time. We can now say that uh, we are in fact operating all year round, uh, not only spring, summer, autumn time, but also in the winter period when our sailing vessels are up north. Now, our core uh, season, we spend up north uh, during the time period or during the month, May to September in Svalbard, Spitsbergen. And uh, then we carry on with uh, 
finishing our season in East Greenland uh, late August uh, and September. By the way, also Rembrandt uh, van Rijn is sailing in August, uh, September in East Greenland. If you're interested in that, we offer fly and sail itineraries um, that are uh, very exciting um, because you fly over the distance from Iceland to Greenland and then uh, you get straight on the ship uh, for the sailing program in the interior parts of the Scoresby Sound. Now, North Norway is our topic uh, for today. Uh, we'll be talking about that, or better, co uh, well, here, Bo will be uh, talking about uh, uh, North Norway. This is the, the region uh, of interest uh, right now. Um, you may have been there already, and this place is beautiful. It's uh, um, a little bit different to uh, the wilderness areas that uh, we are sailing to in uh, the other parts of the polar regions because we are here in a cultural environment so we stop in small uh, settlements we go to villages we do a little foot walk also on, on tarmac we we go along roads and into the back country um, so we see people along the way um, and uh, the details about the itineraries are spared at uh, now uh, because uh, uh, Bo will be talking yep. about that in a minute. What is uh, our focus up here uh, to bring it down to the point is nature, wildlife and activities. Nature, wildlife and activities, um, um, beautiful mountains rising up to just over a thousand meters above sea level. Yep. We have uh, sea eagles, uh, humpback whales and orcas and uh, beautiful fishing villages uh, up there. Our fleet, that is also part of uh, our company, that's our pride. Um, the smallest uh, ship in the fleet is uh, Rembrandt. Uh, Rembrandt uh, offers space for 33 passengers in just uh, 16 cabins. Uh, it includes one uh, triple cabin um, and uh, the rest of it is uh, twin uh, cabins, porthole cabins and inside cabins. You see the little icons uh, on the bottom of this picture, hopefully, and uh, there you see uh, bunk beds inside the uh, cabins, uh, and all cabins have a uh, shower and toilet inside the cabins and suite facilities. That is a big, big bonus. A lot of travelers like it when they come on board, of course, uh, that is a nice surprise uh, and uh, provides a little privacy when you're back in your cabin. Now we have a lot of open nice. space on, on board, uh, a small bar, library, um, a, a dining uh, room, and the dining room is also at the same time um, our lecture facility where Bo and uh, uh, the guides um, will do their talks and introduction to the daily program. Now, uh, the rest of our fleet, and that uh, will bring me towards the end of my little introductory talk, is the, the motor vessels here just uh, presented, uh, Plancius and Ortelius, uh, both have capacities of uh, around uh, 108 passengers, uh, followed by uh, the Hondius over 170 passengers and Jansonius to come next year. Uh, also uh, around 170 passengers. Uh, she is the sister vessel of uh, Hondius. Um, all ships are ice strengthened, uh, ready to rumble in uh, deep field ice locations uh, right inside the pack ice. And uh, as said earlier, um, Ortelius also carries two helicopters, but only for uh, Antarctica. Now activities are really at the heart of our interest. Uh, uh, we are not only just good at the uh, nature wildlife uh, observation and uh, we also want to bring our passengers into swing really. They get out on zodiacs, uh, we land them in remote places, uh, we uh, in involve them uh, in uh, activities, uh, hiking, kayaking, mountaineering, uh, and all that. Um, and also expert, uh, uh, experts can come with us. Uh, we offer uh, ski and sail trips. Uh, Bo will mention that later for Northern Norway. And also the divers uh, are quite happy to come with us because they see the vessel as a floating hub, as a base camp. Uh, to spend the day outside, come back to the vessel uh, uh, later in the afternoon or early evening, and then you socialize on board and the ship will be repositioned to another position overnight. And then the next day we'll have a new location where we land our passengers. This is a little picture on the activities that we do in Antarctica and the Arctic. Uh, in Antarctica, we camp on shore. We offer overnights, but we don't do that in the Arctic because of course there's uh, polar bears in uh, Spitsbergen. So um, uh, that it would be a little bit dangerous to do that. Now, you will now see a short trailer of our 
Rembrandt voyages in uh, North Norway. You see the, the ship offers a lot of uh, outer space on the, on the open deck. Um, our expedition leader, Christian Engerke, one of the expedition leaders uh, who's also working on board, uh, he's uh, giving a comment here um, on this film. You can also download the film on the agent section uh, later, or we'll be sending those uh, films to you in a follow-up uh, email after the presentation, so you, you have uh, access to the film straight away. You don't need to search for them. Yep. Uh, humpback whales, uh, orcas, we hope to see in the early season. There's a great scope for hiking in the outdoors. Um, this is really a beautiful uh, place to be. You see rugged mountains all around, uh, deep cut fjords. Uh, we are sailing into literally with the small ship, we can go to every single corner of it. Yep. We can anchor, we can stay on shore wherever we want to be. Our passengers, you see, they, they are younger people, middle aged. Sometimes they're also a little, they are older. It doesn't really, age doesn't really matter. Uh, as young as you feel, as fit as you are, everybody is welcome. Um, they're all like minded on board. Uh, if you come with us, uh, you're really nature, wildlife focused, and uh, you want activities on shore. We spend time on shore. That's the Northern Lights in Northern Norway. Now I will pass on to Bo, and uh, here you go. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Florian. And uh, yeah, welcome uh, to our little online webinar, everyone. Um, I noticed a few questions already, so that's fantastic um, interaction. Um, but we will get into uh, a lot of those questions as well as we go along with this uh, talk. Um, someone mentioned sustainability. Florian will, after my bit of the talk is over, Florian will jump back in for another 10, 15 minutes at the end um, and discuss these sort of things, sustainability for the future um, and ongoing operations uh, once we give, uh, hopefully get back into operation next year. But. Moving on, so uh, just to, to cap off, to, to start things off, I want to talk a little bit about staff and safety. So going on into staff. So for example, um, uh, the Nord, uh, the uh, the Nordlish, the uh, the Nordlish has one guide. The the Rembrandt has two guides. Um, Plancius and uh, Ortelius generally have eight or nine. It's uh, also a little bit dependent on the larger vessels as to what type of voyage that we're running. If it's a base camp, if it's a standard trip, if it's a charter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, the numbers of guides uh, tend to fluctuate a bit. Hondius and Ansonius can be around 12, 13, 14, um, something like that. Um, but one thing I want to touch on, and one thing that I will be mentioning and touching on throughout this whole uh, presentation as sort of an ongoing theme is particularly with oceanwide is flexibility and um, it's really important for oceanwide for our staff that um, and this touches on with safety as well that everyone is a bit I'm a, you know I'm very much an all-rounder and a lot of the guides working not everyone but most of the guys working for oceanwide are all-rounders that means that almost anyone can carry a rifle up in Svalbard almost anyone can jump into a zodiac um, and drive a Zodiac if need be. Almost anyone can lead um, any of the, the hikes or expeditions. And it's not every every guide in every company that can do this, but with Oceanwide, it really is um, a, a high sort of point um, that anyone can jump in. And that goes on into safety as well. If someone is maybe a guide is, is, is feeling a bit down or, or is a bit sick and someone can just jump in, it's really flexible that we can all jump into various roles quite quickly and quite easily with very little or no prep. Um, and that also touches on with safety. And of course, we always go through our safety briefings uh, before every voyage, before generally we leave port even. Um, this is mandatory and just so that everyone knows what to do in case of an emergency, if something happens, where to find and how to put on your life jackets, how to put on the safety survival suits, um, these sort of things. So that's all something that we go into on every voyage um, before we start um, even start leaving the, the, the pier or leaving the port. Moving on, four reasons why us. There can be many different reasons, but of course, um, four main ones that I'll touch on. Um, Oceanwide is, is are really pioneers. Um, and what I mean by that is they're pioneers of the expedition cruising industry. There's a lot of ships that uh, do cruising. There's a lot of ships that, that maybe mention they do expedition, but Oceanwide is one of the very first companies that have ever done this sort of trip. And, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, uh, 50 years ago, this was almost unheard of to be able to do the sort of things that we are now doing. Um, and to offer the amount of activities that Oceanwide offers is really something that's unique to Oceanwide. And they're really a pioneer in that aspect, having or tell is that that can have helicopters do the the, the emperor penguin um, trips over in the uh, the Waddell Sea. These are all something things that are unique and, and have been started um, as pioneering company uh, oceanwide um, flexibility. Again, I've, I've mentioned that. I'll continue to mention that. Um, 
as an example, I've literally seen um, other ships while I'm on uh, one of ocean wide ships. We're somewhere, Northern Norway, Svalbard, et cetera. We have some whales in a bay. We're enjoying them. We're, we're watching them. Another ship simply sails by and literally does not stop because a lot of other companies, their priority, unfortunately, is to stand by their plan A and to, to keep to their timings. Of course, we have a plan A, we have a plan B, we have a plan C all the way through Z. Um, plans are made to be broken. And the whole reason we operate and we do this is to be able to provide, to spend time with nature and to provide the best experience for you, our guests, um, agents, et cetera. So if we see wildlife, if we see nature, of course, we're going to stop and spend time with that. But other companies are sometimes so focused on holding on to their timings that they sail right by. And I've personally seen this, and I find that um, a little bit of a sad thing. Um, Oceanwide owns and operates. This, this seems may seem like something that all companies do, but actually most companies do not own their own vessels. They actually lease or charter their vessels through other bigger concerns um, over multiple years. So maybe they have a one-year, two-year, five-year lease contract um, from another company, a bigger company that actually owns the ship. That means that these other companies either cannot or have very little say in how they organize the ship and how they outfit the ship and how they crew the ship and how they staff the ship. Oceanwide owning their own vessels has full control on how they decide they want to operate the ship, how they want to outfit it, how they want to use it for specific purposes. And that is a huge flexibility advantage that Oceanwide has. Um, and of course, uh, as a last one, of course, there's ships, of course, we're sailing on the water and that is enjoyable in its own right. But part of Oceanwide's ethos is to maximize time on land. Um, Oceanwide is one of the companies that offers by far more activities and variety activities um, than any other company, and especially hiking and things like this. Some companies, there might be other companies that offer hiking, but the reality is they might offer one, maybe maximum two hours a day or per outing. Oceanwide offers three hours, four hours. Even sometimes we might take a packed lunch and spend eight, nine, 10 hours out in the uh, in the field going uh, hiking and on adventures. So of course there's time at sea, that's important, that's a requirement, but we look at our ships as being a base camp so that we can try and spend as much time out in the field, out on land, hiking, doing activities and enjoying nature as much as possible. So touching on uh, the itineraries and where we go, of course, Northern Norway, um, you see here in the Northeast, we have sort of the black line and then we have a dotted line here to the Southwest. Um, we operate in all these areas, but to the Northeast, the main uh, full line, that's, that's our primary area, okay? Um, for whale watching, for hiking, there's many different uh, fjords, there's many different small villages and different things we can do, but primarily the, the animals, the whales uh, for the whale watching trips that we want to uh, be spending time with are in this area to the northeast. Um, and lots of options for hiking as well. Of course, it all depends on weather. It depends on um, week to week is always different. Uh, my plans as an expedition leader, the plans of the captain with safety, with weather, all these things we take into consideration. Each trip will be different. And sometimes it might mean the weather looks so horrible, the, the, the forecast for in the northeast and it looks so much better in the southwest we'll go to the southwest it's still beautiful there's still fantastic options there um, but just so you can understand this sort of graphic our primary primary area of operation is going to be in the north uh, northeast chevoy this sort of area this is an example itinerary from a ski mountaineering tour um, but again there's there's many more fjords many more villages um, that we can go to we have we have like i said plan a plan b plan c different spots to stop at for hiking for viewpoints for kayaking for snowshoeing whale watching, all of these things. Um, so this is just a very sort of brief uh, sort of example of what uh, is possible, but this is the general area that we're going to be operating in for these voyages. Um, so a bit of a season overview, of course, uh, about end of October, beginning of November until end of January. These are our um, whale watching uh, and northern lights trips. This is really the focus because the, the whales, and when I say whales, I mean humpback whales and orcas, killer whales, um, they're following the herring because the herring um, is their food source. And the herring is in these fjords northeast of Tromso during these months. And the herring literally moves out of these fjords around end of January, beginning of February, and moves out into the open ocean about a couple hundred uh, kilometers north of uh, Northern Norway. Um, and that's why we switched to a different itinerary. But during this time, is when we want to focus on the whale watching because the whales are there in the fjords. Um, beginning of February until end of March, um, as I said, this is when the whales have then moved out. Of course, there's still plenty of other wildlife. Uh, Florian mentioned um, 
Sea Eagles, of course, there's always dolphins as well uh, throughout the whole year in these fjords. Uh, but then we have more daylight. Um, the humpbacks and killer whales are gone. And then we can focus more on uh, hiking, the hike and sail trips uh, and doing more snowshoe hikes. We have more time during the day as well, more daylight. Um, and we can do longer and more strenuous hikes. And that's when we focus on those right there. And of course, northern lights um, are still there as well. And then end of March till mid-April, this is really finishing off the end of the season before the ship decides to head up towards uh, Svalbard for the nor northern summer. Um, and then we do a few trips, uh, a couple trips usually um, with the kayak uh, and sail program. Um, now, we do have, with the kayak program, we have a kayak guide, so we have the kayak program on board, but we still have a hiking guide as well. So even people who aren't taking part in the kayak program can still, uh, at the same time, take part in the hiking program, and there's still going to be hikes uh, offered and available uh, during that program. And then the very last couple trips of the, the season are ski mountaineering trips with professional ski guides. I am not one, so I do not lead those trips, um, but then we do those as well, and uh, that's often when they go uh, maybe towards Alta and a little bit further out and they try to find places that are really perfect for, for skiing and try to yeah. get their, their vertical um, sort of uh, height meters in. Of course, polar night, a very special experience. Um, one thing to mention is that uh, the Northern Lights are an, an amazing experience, but there might be a high season, what people say, December, January, and this sort of time, but February, March, even April, I've seen not only Northern Lights, but beautiful, amazing Northern Lights. People think as the season tapers off and then suddenly it's officially not the high season, that means that their chances for Northern Lights are very low or, or non-existent. That is ab absolutely false. Of course, the chances are maybe a little bit less because we have less night, um, dark hours during the night, but I have seen amazing Northern Lights even in April um, with only a few hours of, of uh, nighttime, the chances are always there. And of course, we always have crew on the bridge that are looking out for the Northern Lights and they'll alert us and let us know um, when the Northern Lights are there and we'll wake everyone up. Of course, it also helps when uh, you help to, to look out as well. Um, one thing to mention, I, I noticed one little question, um, do we sail to Northern Norway during the winter time? This is the winter program. So this is all during the winter time that we're doing this. During the Northern summer, the Rembrandt is in Svalbard, Greenland, uh, East Greenland, these places, and then we operate in the winter time. So it is cold, it is snowy, but actually because it's on the coast, it's not as cold as people might think. It doesn't get to minus 30 or 40 or 50. It stays because of the coastal climate um, it gets to maybe minus five, minus 10. It can get windy, but it's actually not as cold as people think when you stay along the coast. Um, and we do sail. I'll get into that um, a little bit after. So arriving in Tromso, of course, everyone sort of arrives there on their own, but at five o'clock, um, you'll get all this, uh, the guests always get this uh, as pre-departure information, when and where and how to meet and all this. If you don't know where the ship is, there's a few different piers we use, one main one. But that's fine because we will meet you anyway as guides at a hotel, usually the edge at five o'clock. And it's only a few minutes walk away from where the ship will be at the pier. And it's all flat. So it's very easy to walk to a couple minutes with your luggage, nothing strenuous. And then the ship is there. Of course, if you arrived uh, earlier and you've done a bit of exploring, you might have already found it yourself. That's fine. But if you don't know, no problem. Meet us at the hotel at the designated time and we'll introduce ourselves and bring you to um, the ship. Of course, this is just quickly showing what it looks like during the day. It's an ISPS pier generally that we're at. Um, it is locked, but of course, if you go there and, and uh, no one is maybe there, the crew is always, there's always some crew on board the, uh, uh, the bridge. Um, and if you wave and shout, of course, they'll always let you in, but fear not at the designated time, usually five o'clock at the hotel, we will bring you anyways to um, the ship, no problem at all. Of course, once you arrive and once everyone has arrived, if people are coming at different times, we might have to delay this a little bit, but generally then we do the introductory briefing and uh, safety briefing. So the crew will introduce themselves, the captain, his officers, uh, the, the sailors, the hotel manager, uh, chef, et cetera. Of course, us guides as well, expedition leader and, and assistants. And then we go through the safety briefing. This is also, this is mandatory before we leave the harbor um, of Tromso, just where your life jackets are, how to put them on, where we meet, if we have to muster, and how to put on your safety life uh, suits as well if we do have to abandon the ship just for safety's sake. That is, is very important for us to do. And of course we depart Tomzo. So this is this picture is during the day. It will depend on weather, it'll depend on the itinerary. It depends on, on how soon everyone manages to get to the ship or if there are any delays. Uh, we try to leave the evening uh, of. 
So once everyone comes on board at uh, five o'clock, if everyone is there, we go through uh, our briefings, we have dinner, and then usually after dinner sometime, we try to leave to maximize our time out in the wilderness. Of course, if people are delayed with flights, things happen, that's not a problem. We will just wait until the next morning, um, make sure everyone's there, and then we will uh, depart then. And we still have plenty of time. Um, the distances aren't so huge, um, so it's not a problem to still maximize our time in the wilderness, even if we leave the morning after. Of course, we visit, visit uh, small villages, so even uh, during the evening, even when we're trying to spend as much time as possible whale watching out, into, out in the open fjords, um, the idea is to try and come to small villages and small piers for the evening um, to stay overnight for the purpose of Northern Lights. That in particular is very important for us because you can take photos um, from the ship, even if it's very calm, but the ship will move. And Getting tack sharp photos of the Northern Lights on a moving ship is, is quite difficult, impossible really. So it's always best if we're at a, a pier, um, a little pier like this at a village so that we can always step off the ship when the Northern Lights are there um, to try and get the best pictures as possible. Um, we do have Zodiacs though, in case we do have to go at anchor or if we have to do an activity during the day while we're at anchor, perhaps the pier is busy or occupied with a bigger ship. Um, and we will go through these Zodiac briefings uh, at the beginning of the voyage on the ship, um, showing you how it all works, how to put your life jacket on, how to enter and exit the Zodiac, and all these sort of things. Um, it's not always that we can use the Zodiac. Sometimes we try to use it uh, at least once per voyage so that at least we can get out for a Zodiac cruise or something. It's always a nice experience. Uh, but sometimes we don't use them at all during the voyage. Uh, due to weather, due to conditions, of course, we do try to maximize our time at piers for northern lights and flexibility. Um, so we might not use them at all in any voyage. Um, but we try to go out at least once if we can, just for the experience. But it will always depend on weather, on conditions, on our itinerary. Um, et cetera, et cetera, things like this. And of course, whales. So if we have found whales, if we've been lucky, um, we will spend time with them. We will spend time directly on the ship. And uh, the, the Rembrandt is so quiet, so smooth, and so low to the water um, that it's really not a disadvantage at all compared to, say, going into Zodiacs, which actually can be freezing cold with the wind. Um, this is really, really great. Um, these are two orcas here. And as I said, during the whale watching trips, the idea is to get out in the area that we think or we hope uh, that there should be um, whales and then spend as much time as possible with them before moving on to a pier for the evening. So of course, then we'll come to, uh, to a little pier, as I said, instead of anchor, sometimes we might anchor if we need to, but we really try to come to small piers. Um, that way it just maximizes the flexibility for Northern Lights. And even just want to say, even when there's, it's in the middle of the night, it's cloudy, there's no Northern lights. People think, ah, there's not really anything to do or to see. Go out for a walk in the middle of the dark. It is so quiet, so calm, so peaceful and fantastic. And there's still nice pictures and nice things to experience and see even during the middle of the night in a small village with the Rembrandt, the lights are on, um, still fantastic opportunities to get outside. And of course, even during the whale watching trips, they're not hiking focus, but usually we still have some time in the late afternoon. Once we do go to a pier, even in the dark, uh, we hand out uh, headlamps to everyone um, as well. If you, if you have your own, please bring them. We also have these reflective vests that we hand out to everyone uh, for safety if you're walking along a road in a small village at night or something. But it might just be a one or two hour hike rather than a longer three or four hour hike. And we might not do one every single uh, evening, but we do offer usually a few times throughout the voyage, even on the whale watching trips, just to stretch the legs, maybe burn a few calories. Of course, it's always, uh, it's, it's, it's never obligatory. Um, feel free to, to join or not. People can always wander about um, the small village themselves as well without any, any leadership. That's perfectly fine as well. Going on to the hike and sail. So this is a small, video um, as well. So I'll just talk over that. Of course, we have Jan here, one of our expedition leaders as well. So it might be me, it might be Christian, it might be Jan. We have several different uh, guides and expedition leaders that work um, up here in this area. Always different. One thing I do want to want to mention uh, as well is that oftentimes, you know, I'm Canadian, but I actually live in Germany. I speak uh, decent German. A lot of our guides speak either German or other languages as well. So even if your English might not be perfect or your, your native language, oftentimes there will be someone that maybe uh, speaks a second language um, there that can help out with explanations as well. Snowshoe hiking, snowshoes are one size fits all. So don't worry about that. We do have some children's pair for, for children, but otherwise for adults, they're all one size um, and fits most uh, boots and, and hiking shoes and things like this. Um, so don't worry about that. They're very adjustable. 
wildlife. I'll touch on that a little bit later, but um, of course there is plenty of wildlife even outside of the, uh, the, the whale watching trips um, with other wildlife to see. And someone mentioned sailing, of course, even in the wintertime. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's never a guarantee, but we try and hail, uh, hoist the sails as much as possible. It might be once, twice, three, four times uh, during a voyage, um, but we always try to maximize that opportunity when we can, when the weather works, when the direction of the wind works with the direction that we want to go in. Um, uh, that's always important, um, but that's something that we still always do and knock on wood, um, what we say. Um, I've never had a trip where we haven't had Northern Lights. I haven't had a trip where we haven't managed to sail um, at least uh, a little bit at some point. And sailing with wind power with the engine off is really a fantastic um, experience. And we definitely um, try to do that as much as we can. Yeah, so that's... on. Um, Bo, just to, yeah. just to mention here, slide in uh, one word. Um, yeah. This film and the other film that you have seen earlier, you can retrieve that from our uh, agent portal. And to make it easy for you in the follow-up, uh, you will be receiving an email with a direct link to all this material as well. Um, now, these um, films, um, they have an ocean-wide logo. If you do not feel comfortable with uh, launching a film with our logo on it, don't worry about it. We also have a white label uh, version of these films uh, on our uh, agent portal. You just download them and to add your own logo, you can do that. Uh, that is all uh, free of charge. You can use our materials. Please bring it into Swing. It's there for you to uh, be used and abused. Yeah, use the tools we provide. Um, yeah, thank you, Florian. So just going on a little bit uh, about the hike and sail trips then that start uh, generally beginning of February after the whale watching season has sort of ended and the whales have then moved a few hundred kilometers north. Um, one thing I want to say is that people think, ah, they're, they're hike and sail, they're hiking focused. Um, is it really something for me? I'm not the best hiker or maybe I'm not really interested in going up four, 500 meters, uh, 600 meters up on, on a mountain. Um, there's something for everyone. Um, we're two guides. We always split up into two, into two separate groups. So we can offer a more advanced group and a slower group, a more gentler group. We can also, I mean, everyone can also feel free to wander about any village that we're at on their own. There's no requirement to join any of the hiking groups, of course, that's still fantastic to explore the little villages on your own. Um, but don't feel that the, the any of the hiking groups might be too much for you. We do offer two separate levels. So of course here you can see we do offer a more gentle, uh, easier going uh, hike uh, with one of the guides. Um, and of course this, this it's always dependent on, on the, the place, the area, what the terrain will look like. Sometimes it's in forest, sometimes it's in more open terrain. Sometimes there's a little bit of, of, of height going up and down. Sometimes it's relatively flat, um, but generally the easier group go out for a few hours, nothing too strenuous, plenty of time for photos. One thing to mention as well is that most of the time people can also turn around at their own accord and then just follow the track back to the ship if they uh, would like to do so. As long as you, you let the guide know what you're doing and as long as it's somewhere where the guide uh, doesn't have a problem with that we'll let you know if there's an area where we have to stick together but generally that's not a problem as well if you want to just do half the the hike feel free to tag along once you think ah oh, this is enough let the guide know i'm turning around and i want to go back to the ship and that's fine as well Moving on, of course, we also do then have more longer and more challenging hikes. It might be longer over flatter terrain. We always try to go up uh, go up a, a small mountain or, or a larger hill um, when we can, though, for a viewpoint. Um, sometimes it might be two or 300 meters up. It might be five or 600 meters up. Um, it really is dependent on the, the place, but generally we're out for three, four hours at a time, something like this. Um, for those people that want to burn a few more calories and, and you know, really get the blood flowing um, and have a bit more of a challenging hike. And of course, it's it's absolutely worth it to go out, um, even if you're on the, the the more gentle hike. Even if we don't really get any um, height, uh, I would say any elevation in the hiking. The views are fantastic either or regardless of if you're in the wandering about the village just standing at the pier if you're on the gentler hike if you're on the longer height 600 meters up the views are always fantastic always different this is the Lingen Alps uh, region so beautiful fantastic mountains um, and it's always worth getting out as I said even if you think you, even the gentle hike might be a bit much it's always fine to go out for just maybe half an hour or an hour and tag along and then turn around at your own accord. Um, that's absolutely fine. Um, and of course, in the middle of nature as much as possible, 
There are pine tree forests, but there's a lot of birch trees and birch tree forests that far north. Um, so it's a lot of uh, these sort of very, uh, very quiet and peaceful birch, uh, birch tree forests and lots of different opportunities for photography, even on the, the faster hikes, still plenty of, of time to still stop every once in a while and snap some really fantastic shots. And of course this, for an example, this is also in the Lingen Alp uh, region. Um, but you can see here, this is actually on the gentler hike. I was leading this one uh, this time. And it's, it's very flat, it's very easy going, it's very gentle, nothing strenuous, but the views are still fantastic. You have views deep inside the fjord with the mountains and the light uh, being in the wintertime. Um, you, do, you do still get several hours even uh, during the shortest uh, time period of the year um, of daylight and you, the light is absolutely fantastic for photography and it's just a view, beautiful, peaceful, calm experience. So I always recommend uh, regardless to get out. A little bit about wildlife. These aren't dog tracks as much as they might look uh, like it. They're actually otter tracks, um, river otters, I swear. I grew up in, in Northern Canada and Northern Ontario. I've uh, seen plenty of otters, but I swear Northern Norway has to be the otter capital of the world. I've seen more there than my whole life in Canada combined. Even in the middle of Tromso, um, there are otters literally running around downtown on the sidewalk all over the place. That's how many otters there are. And they're very fast. It's very hard to photograph. That's why I just have a picture of the tracks. Reindeer, there are moose, um, mountain hare, wild rabbits, um, ptarmigan, uh, plenty of, like I said, even when the whales are gone, there's always dolphins around. We may or may not see them. It is wildlife, um, sea eagles, uh, white-tailed sea eagles. So it's never a guarantee, but there is plenty of wildlife around. They are generally pretty shy, um, a little bit skittish, and they're very fast. So it's very difficult to take uh, photographs of them, but they are around and we do often see plenty of wildlife and of course, plenty of tracks um, around as well. And of course, Northern Lights, as I mentioned before, um, one thing to touch on is that, of course, again, it's nature. We can never guarantee anything. Knock on wood <laughs> for luck. I've always, I've never had a trip without Northern Lights. They might be different intensity. They might be stronger. Some, some voyages, we might get stronger, uh, weaker, a bit longer earlier on the trip, maybe later on in the trip, one night or two nights or three nights or every night. It's always different, but I've never had a trip without some uh, northern lights. And I would have to say that to see them while they're this green and this strong is fairly rare. That's actually when uh, you use a longer shutter speed with video or with photography that you can really bring out those green colors. Oftentimes it's a much lighter green, almost grayish sort of color um, that you can see. And with time, you'll, you'll get to know what they, they look like, but it's a beautiful, fantastic experience. Of course, as I said, even during the middle of the night, we have crew um, looking out uh, from the bridge in case they see some. If they do, they wake us up and then we wake everyone else up. Um, but of course it helps when, when guests help out as well. The more eyes, the, the less work. Uh, I guess you could say. And just towards the end here to wrap up a few things, um, museums. Um, this looks like a little house. It was a little house and it's been rebuilt into a small museum. So showing what, uh, there's a couple different small villages that we visit that specifically have museums. Um, this is also no extra cost. So you don't have to worry about paying extra for this. This is included uh, if we do happen to, to visit one. Um, and it's really interesting to see how people have lived uh, in these small villages, very isolated small villages, quite often on islands um, for the last 100, 200, 300 years. And culture as well. TP tents in the Sami language, they call these lavus. Um, and sometimes there are even some villages where we get a local guide who specifically knows that village um, for the last few hundred years and can really go into depth about the, the history and the culture of that specific area uh, from the Sami, from the local Norwegians, um, going back and going back and visiting one of these lavus, these TPs. Um, not only nice from a cultural uh, experience, but also it's a perfect cozy little place to snuggle up inside um, during the middle of the night and to keep an eye out for Northern Lights because they usually have a small uh, wood fire inside. It can get a little bit smoky, but it's beautiful, warm, cozy, perfect for sitting around telling stories, um, especially chatting with any local guides, uh, snuggling up in some reindeer hides and just waiting for the Northern Lights or the dancing ladies as we call them to come on out and show their stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sailing. Um, people have mentioned that. I've touched on that. And again, we try to sail as much as possible. It's never a guarantee how much and when and for how long that we can sail. It has to work with the where we want to go, the wind direction, um, weather, all these sort of things. But again, I've never had a voyage where we haven't gone sailing at least once or twice. Uh, when I say once or twice, pretty much for one day or two days um, out of the, the seven day trip. 
Um, and if we can do more, then we do more. But again, it's, it's always dependent on, on timings, um, whether um, voyage to voyage, it's always a bit different, but it is a fantastic experience. And to be able to put up the sails when everything works out right, you put up the sails and you turn off the engine and you sail along on wind power, um, it really is an amazing experience. I can really uh, see why people get addicted to sailing um, and get their whole lives involved with this passion because it, it really gets a hold of you once you've started uh, going on wind power and it, it's, it's a fantastic, fantastic experience. Yeah, polar plunge. <laughs> Um, perhaps people have heard of it from Svalbard, from Greenland, from Antarctica. We operate in those areas during their respective summers. Northern Norway is the one place where we operate during its winter time. So it is colder. As I mentioned, it's not minus 50 or 40 or anything extreme like this. It still is minus temperatures, minus five, minus 10. Um, it's not everywhere that we can offer it simply because of, of uh, safety with the piers. Um, you can see this one is, is a little bit older, but it's, it's quite okay. Some of them are, are perhaps not intended for this purpose. So there aren't any steps, there aren't any way to safely go down into the water, um, et cetera. Also with weather, if it's too windy, um, things like this. But if the weather works out, everything works out, we will offer it for any crazies that would like to give it a try and jump in and splash about and do a nice minus temperature swim and uh, start freezing their blood in their bodies. <laughs> And towards the end of the trip, it's time to return to Tomzo. So these trips are a week long, um, Saturday to Saturday. So this would be the Friday before the very last Saturday. So the Saturday morning is when we disembark uh, the ship again after the week is over. The Friday before is when we sail back towards Tomzo. Um, we usually have time in the morning, early in the morning for maybe a one to two hour activity. So that Friday is still not just about sailing back to Tomzo. We still offer um, things to do. It's just a little bit shorter um, than the other days because we do have to, to head back and we don't want to end up being late and then people missing flights or things like this. Um, so we always want to make sure that we have a little bit of that buffer time. But and late, late morning, um, just before lunch is when we start sailing back. And then afternoon sometime, maybe 4 o'clock uh, p.m., 4.30, somewhere around there is when we arrive in Tomzo um, to finish off the voyage. And then we have dinner, the last sort of briefings, and then um, generally people leaving the Saturday morning after. But that also gives us time. So getting there Friday afternoon gives people time um, and it's time to experience Tomzo, to give a little bit of time for sightseeing. There's beautiful churches, uh, Scandinavian churches, architecture. Uh, Tomzo is a really bustling, lively, uh, small city. It's, it's very beautiful the way it's situated um, and also souvenir shopping. And I can highly recommend uh, reindeer salami for uh, those who might like a little bit of meat. Reindeer salami is excelente. Well, try it. <laughs> yes, please. Please do. And just to wrap things off before I hand back to Florian, who will uh, wrap this sort of webinar up and then touch on a few other uh, items of, uh, of note. Yeah, perhaps uh, if you're lucky, you might have a view like this as you're flying home from Northern Norway. Uh, it's not so often that you have clear skies like this, but once in a while, uh, the skies open up and you can see all the, the, the snow-capped mountains, um, ice, the, the ice-covered uh, lakes, rivers, fjords, all these sort of things. Um, and I really think that's a fantastic way to end off uh, a trip to Northern Norway, a place that I really uh, love. Partly because, of course, I love the polar regions, north and south. It's all fantastic for me. But northern Norway has a special place in my heart because it's actually very similar to where to the areas that I've grown up in northern Canada as well. Uh, very similar sort of terrain, um, sort of area, similar wildlife. Um, different but also similarities in culture as well within the northern cultures and communities i find a lot of similarities so i, I almost feel at home i feel i do feel quite at home um, guiding in northern norway and uh, hopefully you've experienced a bit of that enthusiasm from my side and uh, hopefully we'll see each other again um, operating next year up in northern norway on the rembrandt thank you guys very much and back to you florian okay both thank you uh, very You're much welcome. for that uh, talk uh and your explanations uh, about North Norway. Um, I think um, even though um, partners uh, have been up uh, north in Scandinavia, it is always good to see how we run through day by day itinerary. And it's flexible. We go to places that suit us best, really, according to the, the wind, the weather, uh, the wildlife uh, that we see uh, along the way. And uh, that is very important. It's great uh, to have you here today. Um, thanks for the talk again. And uh, stay with us for a moment because I have another uh, 10 minutes to wrap up uh, to finish uh, off. Uh, after an hour presentation here um, for 
you, the agencies, uh, of course, you like to know that uh, we care about uh, certain items, uh, certain parts of our operation. Um, it is always good to know that uh, once you have booked people with us uh, on our itineraries, uh, I'm sure you've been in touch with us uh, with our reservation department, uh, you receive uh, in preparation of your voyage uh, travel documents that uh, provide you with uh, detailed information on, for instance, uh, the clothing uh, that you need to bring, there are equipment lists, an expedition manual, uh, extra uh, and ad additional information that uh, will be helping you to, to get prepared for your trip. Now, for the clothing, um, you just need to know that uh, you uh, dress up just like you would uh, spend a holiday in the Alps, a skiing holiday. Um, uh, you dress up in three layers. Um, very important to, to have wind and waterproof uh, outer layers, um, breathable uh, fabrics uh, and uh, warm jackets uh, with you, an extra jacket, uh, uh, a nice one would be to bring as uh, a down jacket uh, that you can also wear underneath uh, a waterproof jacket. It keeps you uh, nice and warm um, when you spend um, hours outside, not during only the walking, but when you stay static on the, on the outer deck, when it, things are getting cold uh, and and uh, the, the wind is uh, blowing in your air, in, in your face, and then it is really good that you dress up warmly, including warm winter boots. It's very important that you bring those. Um, on the motor vessels, uh, Plantius, uh, Ortelius, Hondius, and then in the future also Jansonius, we carry uh, neoprene boots. They have a high shaft. They are really warm and toasty. Um, we provide them on board free of charge, but we cannot do that on the Rembrandt uh, because we do not have space to store um, all these items on board uh, so we would kindly ask you to inform your uh, clients um, to bring these boots uh, not wellies because they are cold warm winter boots will be great uh, with a good grip uh, anti-slip sole um, that helps for the for the walking in the afternoons and the evenings and all these boots uh, doesn't matter which ones uh, good warm walking and hiking boots uh, they fit on our snowshoes. Uh, the snowshoes have um, a flexible binding and uh, they fit on all boots. Uh, so make sure you have the, the right clothing with you. Now, um, for the evenings, uh, that's that's a small detail, uh, but uh, you will then uh, also have to remember to bring a head torch with you. It helps when you walk in the dark uh, to find your way back to the vessel. Maybe if you walk uh, just by yourself or with one of our guides and also uh, 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 cars will see you on the roads and uh, it's always uh, good to be seen uh, when you walk in the dark. Um, a small item like a thermos or a thermal mug, uh, a drinking cup that uh, you can bring in your personal luggage is good when you want to keep your drinks uh, uh, nice and warm. When you again spend time uh, on outer deck uh, during the night, for instance, when you want to be patient enough to wait for uh, the northern lights and see when they pop up, uh, then you are there. Um, so we have a lot of people who, who really spend a lot of time uh, outside also for photography and then uh, just make sure you have all your uh, protective items uh, with you, uh, including also these uh, little gadgets like uh, Thermomug. Um, uh, Bo um, has given us details on the hiking voyages, uh, the parallel voyages that we run on those hike and sail trips, the easy and more challenging ones. It doesn't matter which hiking trip, it's always good and uh, we advise and recommend to bring hiking, hiking poles for the snowshoe hikes uh, because we will be going out uh, on the open terrain, there's no tracks, it is deep snow and then the, the hiking poles help a lot uh, to keep the balance. Is that correct, Bo? Yep. Yeah. yeah. There will be a bit of a track for the people behind me because I'll be breaking the trail, but <laughs> there's no groomed track. It's 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 often that we're walking just in the deep snow in the middle of the floor. Yeah, definitely. Now, have. I have I have a slide here with uh, information on uh, environmental uh, sustainability measures. Uh, of course, uh, not only agencies, you um, also our uh, uh, guests. They approach us, uh, they are interested in uh, what do we as a company do uh, to minimize the impact of uh, the cruise operation once we're in uh, sensible polar regions. And uh, we have various ways of uh, doing that. In fact, uh, many years ago, 
even before others started with it, uh, we have used uh, low sulfur marine gas oil, uh, MGO uh, fuel, and uh, that is uh, and more environmentally friendly than uh, the uh, heavy uh, fuel, uh, which are also banned, uh, by the way, in the, in the polar regions. So we've always been well prepared to to go there into the remote regions by using this uh, uh, type of fuel. Um, our vessels, most of them run on diesel electric engine power, um, uh, both uh, the larger and the smaller vessels. Uh, and that means also that uh, it gives a, a, a big advantage also for wildlife uh, opportunities. So when we're up there in Spitsberg and Svalbard and we want to approach uh, polar bears, and uh, I don't know what a You've been sailing with us on the Plantius, for instance. Uh, uh, the Plantius is a very silent uh, uh, vessel in the ice. Uh, we switch off the engines, we go on diesel electric, and it is just a, a very silent uh, way to move forward. So, uh, and it's also a very respectful uh, way to approach uh, the wildlife. Um, we try to stay out of single use plastic wherever we can. Um, we do that in normal lives at home in our private uh, surroundings. Of course, everyone is doing that, uh, but you can cannot uh, completely uh, avoid that uh, because uh, also food items they are packed up in plastics. But now um, also items that are totally unnecessary, like uh, plastic straws. We don't need them. Why? I mean, you can just uh, drink uh, off a bottle uh, of good beer from the Netherlands, um, and uh, you don't need plastic straws uh, for anything. So we don't carry those uh, on board of our vessels, uh, uh, we leave that uh, away. Now, if you really want to go super environmentally friendly, yeah, well, then come on the sailing vessels uh, because they use the wind power per se, per nature. Um, we go along with uh, the flow. If the wind uh, comes from the right direction and uh, we will then uh, pull, uh, bring the the sails out and the sail with uh, the wind under canvas. And it is an, an enlightening experience for everyone on board. Not only the guides are fired up for that, uh, also our passengers, they love it to bits uh, when uh, the captain informs that we, we're putting up the sails. We do that uh, mostly in the um, open waters where we have a little bit more room to navigate, not really in the, in the narrow waterways or the, the bays and the fjords uh, that will be a little bit tricky in there um, to maneuver, uh, but uh, on the North Norway uh, itineraries, the ones that uh, you've been introduced to by Bo, uh, we will be doing both going on um, uh, engine power in in the interior parts of the fjords, but we will also be using uh, the, the sails wherever we can because we want you to be part of this experience. It is great. You will love it to bits. Now, um, the Waste that we produce on board um, will be separated on board uh, and that will help a lot uh, to recycle all these uh, items uh, when they come uh, on shore later. Um, we do and never dump anything into the sea. I, I occasionally hear that uh, from uh, uh, people addressing that question to us. Uh, what would we be doing if we are crossing um, uh, large open uh, sections of sea. Um, we are never um, putting uh, any waste waters into or uh, waste materials into the uh, open sea. Uh, we'll carry that back into civilization and get rid of that there. Now, um, also another way of helping us and helping nature is uh, assisting with the removal of uh, swept the shore shoreline plastics in Svalbard, for instance. On the Ortelius next year in June, we have uh, allocated one uh, trip. It's a dedicated voyage for, uh, well, in fact, it's a base camp voyage, but during that base camp voyage, we also offer uh, to the passengers uh, to, uh, uh, indulge with uh, um, collecting rubbish on the shorelines, on the remote shorelines, and there will be all sorts of fishing nets and uh, buoyancies and things that uh, um, wildlife can get tangled up with. Um, so we try want to collect that, bring it back to the ship and uh, drop it off in Longyearbyen uh, when we arrive back in Longyearbyen. And that is great help uh, from each and every one. It's not uh, compulsory, obligatory. Um, you're invited uh, to help. You can help. Um, if you do not want to uh, be part of that, you don't have to. And nobody is uh, forcing you to do it. Uh, but we offer room for this activity. Uh, so that's why I thought it's worth uh, mentioning it here. 
Also, the national programs, um, whenever they approach us, uh, we help scientists um, studying or uh, conducting their science uh, in the field. Uh, now, for next year, we are cooperating with uh, the German Institute, uh, Alfred Wegener Institute. They, they need to collect uh, remote uh, measurement uh, items in the mouth of Scorospisund. And we will be sailing there um, with uh, our vessel Plantius, and uh, we are crossing these coordinates and we invite these uh, scientists to come and travel with us. We collect their items, they can do their science, they talk to our passengers on board and uh, give some feedback on uh, what their science is all about. Now, other small items, I wouldn't go too much into depth here, LED lightning, uh, steam heating, uh, biodegrad biodegradable paints that we will be using um, uh, on board, everything will help um, to also minimize uh, fuel consumptions and uh, CO2 emission respectively. Now coming to the very end of the presentation, we are getting close now to the end. Um, I also want to highlight uh, this section also, um, well, environmental, um, uh, that in environmental information and also health and hygiene, you find on our website on uh, the landing pages. Please just check in the menu, go to uh, about us and you find some uh, further and uh, in-depth information about uh, our uh, environmental concept and also health and hygiene. Now in COVID-19 times, it is very important also to mention that we have a health and safety protocol and it's an enhanced one. Having said that, um, uh, we only and we will only operate again uh, when this COVID-19 curse has gone and all the travel restrictions are not in place anymore. Um, right now, we don't think as a company it is uh, right to take people on board and to start cruising uh, halfway through the season. Uh, we have decided to leave our ships in port where they are nice and safe and uh, we sit it out and wait for better times. So we hear good news about uh, vaccines coming our way from all uh, over the place. So fingers crossed for next year, it will be a, hopefully a better year for tourism and all of us yeah. in our private lives that um, we uh, can operate uh, and reintroduce our voyages in uh, the Arctic. Now, what we will be doing then if we restart our cruise programs, we have automated temperature screening on board. Uh, we will do an extra cleaning. Uh, measures will be introduced with uh, dispersion technology. Please look it up on our website. It gives you further details here if you're interested in that and you also want to broadcast that to your clients. And um, we will be using air filtration units, UV-based filtration technology and uh, all this. Now, um, we keep the distancing rules on board as well, all the hygiene that you also now practice uh, in your home countries, washing hands, disinfecting, um, face mask. I've been asked today, uh, will we be using face mask on board? Well, if we would be sailing today, yes, we would be using them, but hopefully next year we do not need them anymore. But we don't know. We don't have a crystal ball here, but we are prepared. Uh, we have now a lot of time to um, for the get our concepts right, and then we will be the uh, back on next year. Now, that brings me to the very end of our presentation. I want to say thank you first to you, Bo, for hanging in here and uh, giving us a great uh, overview of uh, uh, North Norway and your experience yeah. up there. We want to see you back next year. In fact, you're coming on board on the November and December voyages, Rembrandt 41, 42, 43. Um, yeah. Look out for Bo. If you have questions and you want to know which dates uh, they are, please uh, ask us, approach us. Yeah. Um, a and very Florian. Yes, well, you're welcome. But I, I still have one piece of information. Sorry, I'm stretching this a little bit, but... Um, we are pleased to announce that we have an early bird discount uh, for our uh, agencies that want to book between now and the 31st of January. Uh, that is uh, roughly speaking for the Euro uh, countries, 10% uh, discount on the rec rates. Uh, you will find the revised the dates and rates in the email follow-up uh, that will be sent to you. Um, and uh, please take advantage of that on the discounted rates. Uh, they will be time limited until the end of uh, January. You will be receiving your standard uh, commission level. And uh, there you go. Take it um, and uh, be our guest on board. I want to say thank you to all of you for tuning in. Yep. We hope you stay safe and healthy.
And uh, above all, we really hope to see you around at some point uh, in the future. So Indeed. nice talking to you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Florian. Thank you, Oceanwide. Ciao. Bye.